champion guitar players, have you ever wondered how some really great players are always able to play with intense emotion? Hi, I'm Tom Hess, and when I was learning to play guitar, I was amazed by how my favorite players played with tremendous feeling. And I wanted to play like that too, but even once I learned the licks or the solos or the songs, my playing just didn't have the same emotion. It wasn't as dramatic as my favorite players were able to play at the time. Now, that was really frustrating for me, but what I later learned was some simple ways to take any guitar lick and squeeze every drop of feeling out of them and how to create my own guitar solos that sounded cool by improving my phrasing. So I've taught these same things to thousands of my private online guitar students over the years. And today I'm gonna to share some of that stuff with you. So the first secret that I'm gonna share with you is that certain scales and certain modes are naturally, inherently more dramatic. They have more emotion to them. They're more intense emotionally than others. So the specific backing track that I was playing over in the beginning is using the most dramatic, the most sad, the most soulful scale, in my opinion, in the universe. Now, I've got another video on YouTube that goes into detail about what that scale is and how it works. Okay, so if you're interested in that, check out my video on YouTube called The Saddest Scale, The Most Emotional Mode. Now, real quick here, before you go check that out, I'll simply tell you what the scale is. It is the fifth mode, that's mode number five, of the melodic minor scale, okay? So that's the set of scales or the modes that I'm gonna be using here. You don't have to know all the details of what that scale is right now in order to learn the concepts, but I just wanna give you a background of the fact that I'm using that scale because while using that scale, it helps me to get more emotion out of the licks that I'm playing, and so I want you to be aware of that. So you can check out that other video on YouTube at any point in time. All right, the next secret here is that in order to get the emotion out of the licks that you play, the solos you create, the melodies and the phrases that you improvise, is to think in small, tiny, little phrases. So if you go back and listen to the whole solo that I played, you can really break these down into very small phrases. And in fact, that's what we're gonna do later in this video is break down some of that stuff so that you can see my thought process behind how this little solo was created. I'm not thinking about it from beginning to end. I am thinking about it in small little phrases and trying to find all the juice I can get out of each little phrase. And you'll see that, we'll go through that together in just a moment. But before we do, you just have to realize the thought process is tiny little phrases, squeeze every drop we can possibly get out of it. No note is wasted here. That's a key concept. So the first phrase that I played goes like this. Okay. Okay. So the keys here are the slide into the first note, and the vibrato. And then there's this part. We're using the third finger in both cases. For the first note and here. And then hammer on pull off slide. So all together. What's not notated, but you probably just saw me do, is after I play the first note, to get into the second note, I actually slid into the second note also. That's not written in the notation, but it is what I'm doing at least some of the time. So it will look like this. So it's, the next note's gonna be the seventh fret. I'm gonna come from below. Those slides add a lot of feeling. All right, now let's hear it with the track 
The first thing I want you to realize is I am not starting on beat one. The phrase doesn't come in, that we don't begin until beat three. And what that does is it creates a more relaxed feeling from the start. If I had started the phrase on beat one, the whole phrase would not, as, would not feel as relaxed, okay? So that's something to note. So here it is with the track. Again, starting on beat number three. So there it is three times. That's the feel of it. It's not a hard phrase. It's not anything, you know, there's no fancy parts to it at all. It's just really concentrating on squeezing the emotion out of it. And sometimes I am delaying the vibrato. So I'm not doing this. I'm not immediately sliding and then doing vibrato instantly. You could if you want to. But I'm sliding, pausing for maybe an eighth note or sixteenth note, then applying the vibrato. Same thing there. Same thing here. So you notice after each note that's going to get the vibrato, I don't apply the vibrato immediately. I hold the note for a split second, maybe an eighth note, a sixteenth, whatever, then I start the vibrato. Why would I do that? Could you do it the other way? Could you do vibrato instantly? Of course you can. Does that sound cool too? Sure, it sounds cool. But it's more dramatic if you don't. It's more dramatic, in, at least in my opinion, you can have a different opinion and that's fine. But for me, to do what's called delayed vibrato. All right, the next phrase is only three notes. It just goes like this. Fourth fret, second fret, first fret on the third string. Now you can use fingers four, two, and one. It's a little easier if you use the middle finger for the bend on the first fret. Because then the first finger can help. Now the key here is that once you do the bend, that you hold that bend out for a really long time over the bar line into the next measure and then you release it. vibrato at the end. So grab your guitar and try it. Try it with me. Do it with me again. Okay, it's simple. Three notes, nothing really fast here. We're just trying to squeeze every single drop of emotion that we can get out of those notes. So let's try it with the track at just random places. So you hear a four count and we'll start. <laughs> Okay, so really anywhere over the track, it's going to sound cool. So again, remember, what we're trying to do is just those first two notes, bend up, hold it, hold it, hold it, slow release, then vibrato there at the end. All right, the next phrase is, again, very simple. 
it's only three notes. And when you're looking at it on the screen, you're probably gonna think, oh, this is super simple. Any idiot can play this. Well, that might be true, but what we're trying to do here is squeeze as much emotion as we can out of these three notes. Now, here's the important part. When I say squeeze as much emotion out of the three notes, we are, in this case, I am not looking to intensify the emotion. I'm looking to do the opposite. I'm looking to bring things down because we had a you know, fairly dramatic opening. The second phrase was much more dramatic. The fourth phrase, the one we're gonna do after the one I'm talking about now, is much more dramatic. It's the climax, it'll be the climax so far. So for the this phrase that is on the screen right now, we want to, I want to bring the emotional level down, the dynamic level down, so that it has, so the next phrase has more power, more impact, more emotion to it. So when we bring down the current phrase, the one that's on the screen now, that will help set us up for an unexpected increase in dynamic level, power, and emotion, okay? So how are we going to take these three notes? <laughs> bring the emotional intensity down. How are we gonna do that? Well, one thing you can do is you can pick the first note and not pick the next two. That will make notes two and three in this phrase weaker, lower in dynamic range, lower in intensity, lower in articulation, and that's what I'm trying to do to set up for the greater power in the next phrase, okay? So what's not written on the screen is that I'm usually sliding into the first note, then slide here, and slide down there, okay? All right. So let's hear that with the track real quick. I'll, I'll play all three phrases we've done so far so what I want you to listen for is when I get to this, listen to how I'm trying to subdue the intensity, bring the intensity down, not up. Okay, so you're gonna hear a four count and then the track will start and then we'll go through the phrases. Three, four. stop the track right before the next phrase would have started. But I hope you're hearing, I'm bringing this down here for what we're about to do next. Now the next phrase is super important. It's the second most important phrase of the entire solo. Why? What makes this one the second most important phrase of the whole solo? Well, let me back up and say that this is the most important phrase that we've had so far. So this is phrase number four, okay? And phrase number one starts off maybe here in terms of intensity. Phrase two is much higher in intensity. Phrase three comes down as low as we can get it in intensity. And then phrase four is gonna be way up here, okay? In terms of emotional intensity, articulation, dynamic range, power, all of those things, okay? Now, why this phrase? Why not one of the others? The answer is the backing track has a very, very important chord change right in the middle of the measure. So where you see that fourth fret, the B note, that note bent up, that's right where the chord change happens. The chord change is here. And it's an unexpected chord change. Okay, it's, for, it's a very dramatic gesture in the backing track because it's using a very special part of the key, of the, of the mode here, okay? So I'm going to emphasize that with power. Okay, so the, so the first two notes are pretty fast. It's just E and G sharp. When you get to this note, 
you want to pick it pretty hard. Okay. So we're going to bend that up a, a half step. So you got to hit it hard because it's going to sustain a long time. So make sure you're picking hard, but make sure that when you pick, the pick goes straight across the strings and not, don't dig down at an angle like this. Okay, don't pick down at an angle, don't pick up on an angle. If you do, you will kill the sustain of the note. Make the pick needs to move straight across the strings, okay? Straight this way. Don't dig down or, or up or do anything goofy like that, okay? Pick straight across. When you do that, you'll get more sustain out of the note. Another little secret there. All right, so let's hear this with the track. So I'll play all four phrases that we've got so far. And again, the main thing I want you to listen for right now is how the intensity of the power and emotion changes from phrase to phrase. They're not all at the same level. We're intentionally trying to modulate the level of, the intensity of, the emotion. And that's what makes this work, all right? So you'll hear a count off. Then the track will start and then we'll play. Three, four. So I'm hoping that you're feeling the emotion here and how the emotion is changing. So when you play it, hold that note, then you release it, and then it's vibrato at the end. If you got your guitar, and I hope you do, play along with me. Ready? Let's do a little slow. Hold it. at the end. And if you want to do delayed vibrato, you can. If you delay the vibrato until after the string is, uh, the string bed is released, so I just delayed it, right? Bend up, bend down, vibrato. You don't have to do it that way, but it sounds pretty cool if you do. All right, so speaking of vibrato, I know that you may have a question or two about the vibrato technique itself. If you need help with that, I've got another video on YouTube you can check out. It's called Vibrato Guitar Lesson 10 Step How To Guide. Go check out that video. We'll go through everything you need to know about mastering your vibrato, and that will help you with the rest of this video you're watching now. All right, the next phrase is only two notes, but I'm doing some pretty special things with these two notes to get the emotion out of, of the two notes. I'm squeezing as much as I can get out of it. So here are the two things that I'm doing in addition to what you see on the page. The first one is I'm doing a rake on the first note, okay? So I'm not just doing Instead, I am hitting strings five, four, three. They're muted. I'm hitting those strings before I hit string two. So you hear the percussive. You hear this. That's in there before you hear this. So I'm taking my palm, okay, and I'm muting strings five, four, and three, but not string two so that we get this percussive to slow it down, so it's hard to slow it that slow and you can't have it be heard clearly. It's fast. It's fast. Now, after I do the rake, I need to make sure that the, the strings, the strings I'm not playing, strings three, four, and five, don't continue to ring out. I want them to be muted, like completely quiet, immediately once string two is playing. Okay, and since I'm not using other fingers on the left hand to keep those quiet, I've got to have some other way to keep strings three, four, five quiet. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm using the thumb of my picking hand to make sure 
that after the rake is done, we don't have any residual strings ringing out that aren't supposed to be ringing out, okay? So my thumb, right now, is lying on strings three, four, and five. As soon as that rake is done, you can see my hand turn. After I pick, you see my hand turn. What you're seeing is my thumb lying on strings three, four, and five. Watch this. You don't need to see it from any other angle. It's not important. All you need to realize is that after the string is played, I'm just taking my thumb and I'm just lying it on the other strings. Obviously, it's not touching string two, but it is touching strings three, four, five, and six, keeping them all quiet so that this note is perfectly clear and doesn't have any noise mixed in with it. Okay, so that's the first thing I'm doing. The second thing I'm doing, actually you can see on the screen, it shows to play the seventh fret and bend up a full step, right? And you can hear that I'm bending it up and then I'm releasing the bend, right? You hear that, everybody hears that, right? But notice that when after it's bent, you, you bend up and you hold it, I'm not releasing the bend all the way down. No, it's not going all the way down. It's coming down part of the way, maybe half of the way. That's why it says half step. It's not exactly a half step. I'm releasing the bend down, but not all the way. And then on the string number five, I'm sorry, on the fret number five. So it's, it's not this. That would be releasing the bend all the way down. That doesn't sound as cool, at least to my ears, it doesn't sound as cool. Okay, so there you have it. Let's hear it real quick with the track. And I'll play it here right in the beginning. It's a pretty dramatic gesture, even though it's just two notes. Here we go, three, four. Let's do it together uh, one more time. Together, grab your guitar, let's try this together, okay? I'm gonna start on beat three. Start, play it with me, all right? Got your guitar. Here we go, we're gonna hear the count off. Two, three, four, one, two. Let's do that one more time. Do it together. Got your guitar. Play along with me here. I'm going to hear the four count. Two, three, four. Pretty cool. All right, now let's take a look at the next phrase. Again, it's just two notes. Just two notes, that's it. These are twin bends, okay? So that means we're playing a bend and then we're playing another bend right after with nothing else in between, all right? Twin bend, not to be confused with a double bend. That's something else. Now, we're gonna play the ninth fret on the second string. So you'll notice in the tablature, Bending up, half step, then coming down, but not all the way. All right, now I am sliding, but I'm picking the 12th fret also. You can do it without picking the 12th fret like this. Okay, you can do it either way. So ninth fret. All right. And again, I'm not releasing the ninth fret bend all the way down. Not doing that. Not doing that. It's more dramatic if you don't. 
Now, for the 12th fret, we have to release the bend all the way down because the final thing you hear in, in measure two is the unbent 12th fret with vibrato, okay? So do release the second note all the way down. Do not release the first note all the way down if you want to do it the way that I was doing it. If you want to do it a different way, great. You can do it a different way. All right, let's hear this one with the track. We'll start here on beat number three. Three, four. Take a look at the next phrase. This one has more notes in it. It goes like this. So I'm sliding into the first note. It doesn't say to slide it in in the notation or the tablature. It's optional. I like the slide. You can do it however you want. Try it with me. I'll play it slower. Pretty cool sound in combination for what happens before and what's gonna happen next. All right, the next example, the next phrase, is the final one of the solo. It is the climax. It is the most important. It is the most dramatic by far. Uh, it's also the hardest. And the reason, what the thing that makes it hard is that we've got a pretty big jump from G sharp, that note, all the way up to E, 24th fret, okay? So what I'm doing is, I'm putting my third finger, you could also use your middle finger if you prefer, I'm putting it on the 19th or 18th or 20th, it doesn't really even matter what fret you start on because it's not gonna last there more than a split second. But you could put it there on B if you want. We're not actually gonna play B, we're just gonna play. And now we're going to slide up to the 24th fret. And you've got to sustain that note. Now, when you play that note on your guitar, there's a good chance that the note is going to start to die. Okay? And you're going to be tempted to want to pick that note again to kind of keep it alive, to keep the note ringing out. And you can do that if you want to. If, you, if that makes you feel better, go ahead and do that. But I'm going to suggest, I'm going to urge you not to do that. Pick the note once. Do nice vibrato there. And if, as the note starts to decay, try to keep it alive with the vibrato, okay? If the vibrato is aggressive enough, the note will not die. It will, some of the note will still last. You'll hear it getting weaker, but if you do the vibrato with enough intensity, it will keep the note sustaining for as long as you wanna keep it sustaining, okay? If you give up on the note and you start hitting it again, which you can do, there's nothing wrong with that, but you miss out on the ability to practice and train uh, getting infinite sustain out of the note. All right, now let's hear the final four phrases, including the one we just talked about with the backing track and kind of put it all together here. So you hear that that final phrase is really dramatic, really dramatic, and we want to squeeze everything we can out of it. So the way that I'm doing that to get it the, the most drama I can is that once I hit that final note, 
the slide to the 24th fret, I'm doing a couple of little things here. The first thing I'm doing is I'm making sure that the pick moves straight across the string and never on an angle, not an angle down, not an angle up, straight across. So if the string is here, I'm going this way or this way. I'm not going down like that, not digging up like this, because you want that string, when you hit it, to be vibrating this way, not like this, not like that. Because if the string starts vibrating this way on an angle when you first hit it, guess what's gonna happen? The string is gonna slap against the fretboard and you're gonna lose some of the sustain. So since we want this note to sustain a really long time, we want the beginning of that string, once it starts vibrating, we want it moving this way where it cannot slap and flop up and down against the fretboard and kill the sustain. That's a really big secret to sustain is how you attack the note, okay? So I will tell you, it took me a long time to figure that out and people paid me a lot of money to learn that little trick, but it works. All right, so if you like what you've seen so far, I've got another video on YouTube called Guitar Solo Lesson, Improve Your Phrasing Immediately, and some of the ideas in that video will help you with the phrases we're doing in this video. All right, let's talk a little bit about how to practice this stuff. The most important thing I can give you, the most important piece of advice I can give you is don't give up on yourself. I see this with students all the time. They give up on themselves. What do I mean when I say they give up on themselves? What I mean is they play a lick, they play an exercise, they play a phrase, they try it, and either it's too hard and they give up, or it's too easy and they move on to the next thing. And either one of those things is bad, okay? You don't want, if it's too hard, just stick with it. You're gonna get it, you'll get better at it. Don't give up on yourself. And the second thing, if something is easy or it appears easy, don't just say, you know what, I got it. This is easy, no problem, move on, show me something harder, show me something else. When you do that, you miss out on all the opportunity to grow as a player, to improve the phrasing, to get more emotion out of what you're doing. So when I practice guitar, very often, I'm practicing two, three, four, five notes at a time. That's it. And I'm trying to squeeze everything I possibly can out of those notes. I don't move on to the next lick or the next phrase. I mean, if I'm practicing technique, I'll do that. But if I'm trying to practice phrasing, improvising, um, you know, just playing with feel, I don't give up on that. Even when I think, I think I've mastered it, I'll try and go back and squeeze even a fraction of another drop out of it. And that's what I would encourage you to do. All right, so if you wanna learn more about how to make any lick you know sound even better, I will show you how in my new free e-guide titled, The Secret to Adding Fire and Emotion to Any Guitar Lick. It's totally free, goes into a lot of detail, so click on the link below to download your copy and make every lick you know sound even better.